Andy's Wonders in association with North East England. Passionate people, passionate places. This programme's about rock. Not this sort. This sort. We have had occasion on these programmes in the past to demonstrate that I am a really useless geologist. But it doesn't take a genius to recognise that Bambra Castle, here on the Northumberland coast, is built on a hill which is made of two different sorts of rock. The pink stuff, sandstone. The black, dolerite. Most of Northumberland is made of sandstone. In ancient times, this area was all covered by a shallow sea with great rivers flowing into it from a landmass to the north. The rivers brought down sand and mud and stuff, and over the ages, as the rivers brought more and more down, the sand got deeper and deeper, and the deeper it got, I'm beginning to sound like the play school guy to geology here, but the deeper it got, the more densely it got packed, until it was crushed together to make sandstone. I'm standing on sandstone, well, actually I'm standing on grass, but underneath the grass there's sandstone. Do you know how much there is? How deep the sandstone goes beneath my feet? 3,000 metres. That's a lot of sandstone, isn't it, boys and girls? You can see it if you look through the, uh, through the arched window. It's an obvious thing to say, though when has that ever stopped me? But not only is Northumberland built on top of sandstone, it's also built of it. Most of the sandstone in North East England is some sort of buff colour. I called it beige once and got told off by a lady from English heritage who said it made it sound like something you'd buy at Marks and Spencer. But up here, the stone is a nice pinky colour and it makes a... Well, as a building stone, it's got some good qualities and some bad ones. Nowhere finer to see both sets of qualities than in the churchyard. The bad qualities first. It's soft, of course, in the sort of weather we get up here in the north, it can erode quickly. I say bad qualities. But to be honest, I don't really think that the softness is a bad quality. Softness leads to weathering, which can create extraordinary effects. And even in walls, the softness leads to the stone being weathered in charming ways, so that the surface and the edges get worn, softened down, giving the wall a texture, a lived-in feel, like an old, much-loved and well-washed sock. One of the lovely things about stone like this is that it doesn't lie about its age, as so many of the rest of us do, of course. And that's because builders at different periods in history like to cut stone in different ways. So a building like this, which has been added to and patched up over the centuries, can be read like a nice stone picture book. I'm sounding like play school again. Quite a lot of this church had to be restored by the Victorians and they used mechanical saws to cut their stone. So their stonework is fairly obvious. It's relatively clean cut and relatively new. But there are lots of other different periods in this church. The Normans, for example, built this bit of the church in the 12th century and they like to cut their stone in small, rather evenly shaped square blocks. You can almost always recognise a Norman wall because it looks like this. 
But round the corner here, there are completely different blocks of stone. These are big, soft, cuddly blocks of stone. Oh, that is one gorgeous hunk of wall. Obviously dates from a different period, of course, from the late 14th or possibly the 15th century, I suspect, but absolutely gorgeous. So you see, even if there is only one sort of stone, sandstone for example, you can't say that a stone is a stone is a stone because there are constant variations. But often, of course, there's more than one sort of stone. Remember the castle. Red stuff sandstone, black stuff dolerite. Though up here it's normally known as windstone. It's a volcanic rock. Scientists call it an igneous rock, forged in the fires deep beneath the Earth's surface and forced up between the layers of sandstone to form black cliffs like this, which stand as some of the most dramatic features on the landscape. Now this is not a soft rock. This is hard, exceedingly hard. Mm -hmm. And you will go a long way before you'll find many buildings made of this. Oh yes. Or perhaps, oh no, not quite so far, because just occasionally the taste for something different overcame the difficulties. This is Bambra House, which was built in the 1830s, in a very attractive, very fashionable Greek Doric style. And where they needed fine detail, they used the softer sandstone, because it was easier to carve, obviously. But for contrast, a contrast that they loved in the 1820s and 30s, they turned instead to windstone. In other parts of the country, soppier places you might call them, they might use painted plaster render for the contrast. But up here, where men were men and women were scary, they turned occasionally to windstone. Did you notice that I said a silly thing back there? Difficult, difficult to tell, tell which one. one. What do you mean it's difficult to tell which one? Such cheek. I was referring to my casual statement about sandstone being easier to shape. Well, here I am with a piece of sandstone in my hands, and what on earth do I do to get it into shape? Do I gnaw it with my teeth like a beaver, or chop it with my bare hands? It's all very well, me blathering on about soft stones and easy to dress stones, but it all seems pretty hard to me. Nowadays, of course, some bits of the job have been made easier because we've got forklift trucks and so on to move the stone about and power saws to cut it with. But a lot of the tools and the techniques haven't changed all of that much in hundreds of years, and stonemasons, just like they always did, create astonishing results with the most simple tools. Basically, just hammery things and chisely things. Those weren't skills that our early ancestors had. They used stone to make defensive walls, but only if there was plenty of it lying around so they could pile it up in heaps. They didn't cut it or do anything with it. The first people to do that in Britain were the Romans. And they, of course, did it in pretty impressive style. I'm here at Steel Rig in the magnificent central section of the Roman wall, which the Romans obviously chose as a building site with its future tourism potential in mind. These cliffs are the same dolerite from the same volcanic eruption as the cliffs under Bambra Castle. Fab, needless to say, as cliffs, but totally scabby as building stone. Far too hard to cut up properly. So the Romans ignored it. 
Well, they use rough chunks of it to fill in the middle of their wall, but for these outer-facing stones, they did what practically everyone else has done since. They turned to nice soft sandstone. They got it from those sandstone outcrops over there. How kind of old Mother Nature to provide such a conveniently handy source. It still had to be cut and carried though, and wherever possible, the Romans tried to cut their stones into bite-sized chunks. Except when they were doing posh bits around doors and windows and so on, they almost always cut the stones to this size. In fact, over the centuries, Roman stones got snaffled and reused in thousands of later buildings. The later builders never bothered to faff on with them and they remain instantly recognisable wherever they are. So there you are, the Romans, the first proper users of stone. But they weren't from here and they didn't stay. So what happened after they left? Who were the next users of stone? Where would we be without Benedict Biscop, eh? That's what I always say. He was the Anglo-Saxon nobleman who, way back in the year 681 AD, founded the twin monasteries of Jarrow and Monk Wearmouth. Here's what I had to say about him in an earlier programme. Now, he was remarkable for loads of reasons, Benedict, but what impressed me most about him was that he made six separate trips to Rome 1,300 years ago. He must have walked or gone in a donkey or something. I don't know how far it is to Rome. 1,500 miles as the crow flies, but that makes at least 18,000 unmotorised miles without benefit of windscreen wipers or in-car entertainment. How on earth did he do it? Ah, a younger and a better Grundy there, recognising the role played by Benedict Biscop in giving Jarrow the earliest surviving window glass in Europe. Well, the same man is said to have been responsible for reintroducing the art of building in stone. On one of his halls in Rome, he's said to have brought back with him workmen from Gaul who were skilled at building in stone, or in the Roman style, as they called it. Until he brought them back, all Anglo-Saxon buildings seemed to have been in timber. Their houses were certainly timber, and probably all of their churches too. But here are the very first stone buildings built by English people, at Sunderland, and of course at nearby Jarrah. By the Tyne and by the Weir. I think I should just stand here for a moment and look proud, in a northeastern sort of way. The Anglo-Saxons, to be fair, continued to live in wooden houses and they only used stone for the relatively modest churches that they built. So it wasn't until the arrival of the Normans that building in stone took off in a really big way. Do you know, I think it's reasonable to describe that as stone taking off in a big way. I still find it impossible to look at something like Durham Cathedral without feeling dumbstruck and without asking dumb questions. How did they do it? How did they get the stone up there? How could they afford it? How did they get away with it? Can you imagine the response from the planning department if you tried to get permission to put that up in the middle of the country today? To answer at least some of those questions, I want to show you my nice book, for which I appear to have lashed out £5.95, a fantastic children's book about how they constructed a medieval cathedral. There's the tools, for example, which don't seem to have changed very much nowadays. And uh, what's scaffolding here, wooden scaffolding. When they were building uh, Cologne Cathedral, one of the towers took 700 years to build, and the original wooden scaffolding was up for the whole of that time. And there's the building, almost full height, surrounded by these tiny little houses. Isn't that fantastic? But how on earth did they get all of that stone right up to there? Well, well, I could show you, but I think it would be better if we went to Beverly Minster so that you could see for yourself. <laughs> Thank you. 
medieval builders had very simple technology, but very effective. A hoist like this one, which has been in use at Beverly for hundreds of years, is capable of lifting the heaviest stones to the top of the highest towers. What a wonderful survival. I've never seen it before today, and I feel really privileged. Mind it's a privilege to come here for any reason. There isn't a better church. There isn't a better stone building anywhere. Everything about this building is stone. Floors, walls, vaulted ceilings. It's the stoniest thing you could imagine. There must be hundreds of thousands of tons of stone here, and yet does it seem heavy, I ask myself? And the answer is no, it does not. It soars. The roof floats above your head. When I was talking about the Roman wall, I was saying that the Romans tried very hard to get their stone from as near as possible. But one of the remarkable things about here at Beverly is that the stone doesn't come from near here at all. It's a new stone to this program. It's magnesium limestone, and it comes from Tadcaster, a good 40 miles northwest of here. It's a marvelous stone, a whiter shade of pale, to coin a phrase. The Romans discovered it and built York with it. Most of York is built of Tadcaster limestone. To get it here 700 years ago, they had to float it down to the Humber estuary in barges and then struggle upstream up the Derwent to here. I think it's remarkable how much effort they were prepared to put in to get the best stone for the job. Some of the stone comes from even further away. All over the Minster there are shafts of something called Purbeck marble. I say something called because this isn't really a marble at all, though it does come from Purbeck. Real marble is a metamorphic rock that started as limestone and then got subjected to fantastic temperatures deep inside the earth and ended up as something else, as marble. Now there is no real marble in England, so we've tended to apply the word marble to any hard limestone that can be polished. It comes from right down on the south coast, from Purbeck in Dorset. And what happened was that the quarried stone was taken to the village of Corf Castle nearby, where there were specialist workmen who polished it and dressed it, and then shipped it all over the country to places like this. They loved it in the Middle Ages. They loved the contrast between the dark, polished marble and the pale limestone, and, and who can blame them? The 13th and 14th century masons who built this church were geniuses. But there's one use that they made of stone that I don't think that anybody has ever improved on. Nobody, in my opinion, has ever shown more virtuosity in the carving of stone than the masons who filled this church with carvings, and in particular, the 14th century carver who created the Percy tomb. I can't believe I'm going to come up with more beautiful use of stone than that. The church and its extraordinary carvings. A clear case to be my Grundy's wonder. It seems impossible that I should be going to crush some sort of stone beneath the old great boot, but in fact, I've been spoilt for choice. There are all sorts of uses of stone that I don't like. The Victorians, for example, got into using something which we call rock-cut stone, like this, hard and angular. I think that they thought it made a building look primitive and ancient, but I think it just makes it look fussy. So that's a crush. 
So is this. A hate sticky stone with a vengeance. I doubt if it's ever been used in a way that doesn't make a building look cheaper, nastier than it was before. Another thing I don't like is pretendy stone, reconstituted stone. If you're going to use stone, use real stone. Just bear this stuff in mind while we go and have a look at my friend Pete's new garden wall. This is Peter's new garden wall. Now he's much more talented than me in such matters, so he designed it all himself, laid his own bricks, and he found real northeastern sandstone for the coping. Now isn't that nice? That's proper sandstone, covered with beautiful variegated colours and a lovely smooth texture. Over the centuries, that'll keep on weathering down naturally and beautifully. Now. Back to the pretendy stone. No texture, no colour, no character. As I said before, if you're going to use stone, use real stone. If you're not, there are plenty of new materials to choose from. It seems pathetic to me if the best that we can do nowadays is a poor copy of the real thing. So there's three things that I don't like. Victorian rock cut stone, sticky stone and pretendy stone. The presenter who slew three with one crush.